Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Pavel Krastev, DDS, New Hyde Park, New York, here with you today. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of myself, Dr. Keanu Shah, and the uh, Global Summit Organization. Uh, as most of you know, the Global Summit Organization is the mothership uh, under which uh, we operate uh, many, many platforms, all geared towards healthcare, towards education and uh, towards uh, uniting doctors across the globe together uh, in all uh, specialties and, uh, and, for, and other persons, of course, uh, that are part of healthcare. Uh, so uh, usually I like to uh, go down the line and thank everyone, but today I'll uh, just uh, make it uh, rather quick. Uh, special thanks to the Dream Team uh, for their hard work. Uh, a hearty congratulations to the top 100 doctors. Uh, uh, you guys are awesome. And it was a pleasure working with all of you, and we appreciate uh, uh, all the efforts uh, that you've put and your time uh, to dedicate to our platform. Uh, so uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah is a very modest kind of guy with a, a very powerful brain, and uh, he came up with this awesome uh, idea and worked very diligently and very hard for many, many years to take it to the level that it is here. And I'd like to personally, uh, Dr. Shah, if you're watching, I'd like to thank you uh, from all of us to you uh, for doing what you've done, uh, for all your efforts, for uniting all of us across the globe. And uh, you're really a pioneer uh, that uh, really is uh, uh, up there in the big leagues uh, uh, amongst the names in dentistry of who's who. So uh, on behalf of all of us, Dr. Shah, we thank you. Uh, so a couple of things uh, that I'd like to discuss in regard to what is the Hex Commission. Uh, the Hex Commission is a subsidiary, uh, you can say, of Global Summits, which is the mom ship. And we uh, show a cross section through healthcare. So we have, uh, of course, uh, as you see our commissioners, they are from medicine, from uh, the area of chiropractic medicine, from dentistry. Uh, we have uh, uh, John Krieg representing pharmacy. So uh, our organization, uh, initially started with dentistry, but uh, throughout the years now of uh, success, we have uh, enlarged it to include uh, basically uh, uh, everyone from healthcare. So uh, our mission is to unite, to share, and, uh, uh, and to become stronger uh, for ourselves, for our colleagues, and uh, generally in healthcare, because we will have a voice when we unite. So uh, uh, a big salute to Dr. Shah. Uh, for doing all this and uh, we thank you all and uh, we're very honored uh, uh, that you join us today of course our audience is uh, everything is thanks to our audience so thank you to the audience and to all the dogs and cats also watching with the audience we love animals and i certainly uh, have four dogs so we're animal lovers so perhaps they're in the audience as well so a couple of things before we uh, before i introduce the commissioners to you guys uh, I want to touch up on a couple of points that I think are important. So the Hex Commission uh, discusses and faces uh, challenges. We, uh, we evaluate the current trends in healthcare and we bring them uh, openly into the uh, public space where our patients also have a voice uh, as to uh, how they perceive things in healthcare. So we encourage uh, uh, all of you to get involved. Uh, this is not just uh, for, for, for colleagues that are actual practicing physicians. It's also to inform the public uh, uh, with all the current trends as, as far as we know, as far as we can tell. Uh, so as we uh, all can agree, I believe, the, the, the globe has faced uh, some turbulent times over the last uh, year or an year and a half. And, uh, it, you know, in the world, this leads to a lack of trust towards people towards healthcare professionals, towards what's going on, because everyone seems to have a different opinion. And uh, yeah, sometimes just simply uh, uh, the trust factor uh, becomes diminished. So I believe that all of us in healthcare uh, have embarked to be parts of a noble profession, uh, whatever it may be that you practice or to whatever level you practice it. Uh, and, and this is something that is very unique to us healthcare professionals because throughout the world, no matter what country you come from, no matter what religious aspirations you follow, no matter what political party you belong to, it doesn't make a difference. We all treat patients. Uh, we all have that in common. 
And uh, when you when I say all, that means all of us across the globe. And if you do the math, that's a lot of healthcare professionals uh, across the globe. So when we unite, our voice uh, becomes more audible. And uh, of course, our uh, ability to make small positive trends in healthcare, uh, you know, uh, become possible. So, you know, I urge all of you, uh, put your differences aside. And not just you doctors out there, I mean you, the audience, put your differences aside. We're all human beings. Uh, I, I strongly believe that what color we are, where we come from, it doesn't matter. Love each other. I'm here to promote peace on earth. Okay. And as doctors, I feel that we have an obligation uh, to do so for our communities. And that doesn't mean we can't disagree. Of course we can. If you take a cross section of the country, half go this way, half go that way, and that's perfectly fine. But I think that opens uh, uh, debate for learning, for hearing the other side's views, for discussing things in a civil and logical manner where we can all learn from each other and put an end to the nonsense of this hatred and this and throwing rocks at each other all day. You know, that's not right. And uh, I urge all of you uh, to uh, fight for peace. Now, regarding the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, variants, as you guys know, uh, it's, it's up and down, depending on which country you look at, uh, the, the uh, mutations are starting to occur. And, you know, sometimes we, we want magical answers for a process which is very dynamic. It's changing day to day. And we often throw, again, rocks at each other without, uh, uh, not, I shouldn't say without, but without knowing the exact sequelae of how this will be, uh, illness and virus will develop in the future. So it's very difficult to gauge something and to make predictions uh, regarding its path forward because we are not psychics uh, after all, you know. And uh, so, uh, doctors, us, you uh, in the audience, especially the young ones, uh, you guys are in line to. Uh, uh, carry the torch forward of healthcare and, uh, and promote the wellness of human beings across the globe. So we, uh, with the HEX commissioners, uh, we, we strive to give you a cross cut again, as I said, across different professions of mistakes we've made of uh, certain issues that we feel are pertaining to uh, all of us. And, and uh, we, we had a very successful HEX meeting one and HEX meeting two. Uh, where so many important points were brought up by all these um, uh, uh, commissioners and the previous ones that were featured in the first uh, show. So we encourage you guys that missed the first two shows, watch them, uh, uh, pay attention to them. You may learn something. And uh, uh, kind of lastly, before we um, uh, jump in more, before I introduce the commissioners, uh, what I want to say is uh, you see the little QR code uh, right there. Uh, that'll take you straight to the top 100 uh, doctor website where there is uh, invaluable information uh, of uh, the organization, what we do, what we don't do, certain perks. And uh, of course, there's uh, many, many, uh, actually all of the partners and all the shows that have been done previously, they're posted at the Global Summit Mothership Organization in case you want to uh, view them. So uh, without further ado, I guess let's say hi to our commissioners. So we have Dr. John Kriak. Uh, he's a farm D, uh, great fellow. I've had the, the pleasure of, hi, hi John, and, uh, of listening to him many times and uh, uh, much to learn from him. We have Dr. Alan Chong, who represents the uh, field of uh, chiropractic medicine. Hello. Uh, dear friend of mine, great guy. Uh, and uh, again, he'll update us uh, on his uh, main topic today and then We'll have our round table. Then we have Dr. Susan Trong. Uh, she's in the field of optometry. Uh, Dr. Emily Letran, a fellow dentist. And of course, we have uh, the man with many feathers in his hat, Dr. Professor Pritandir Singh from India. He's oh. a world renowned uh, uh, clinician and academician. And he always likes to get a feather in his hat. So today, I will give you another feather, my brother. And of course, we have Dr. Gerald Nizn, uh, excuse me, Gerald Morris, uh, uh, represents uh, internal medicine in the field of medicine in general. Uh, Dr. Gerald, I've had the pleasure to watch uh, in the past. His wife is also a medical doctor, as far as I know, and they share an office. So he's a wealth of uh, knowledge when it comes to uh, uh, operating an office, running a practice, etc. 
So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I guess uh, I'll have you say hello to, uh, to our audience. And then uh, little by little, we can start uh, uh, jumping into to the updates that Jua will share with uh, all of us today uh, regarding where we were, uh, where we're going, and some of the uh, things on your minds. So Dr. John Kriak. Hello, everyone, and thank you. Uh, thank you to all the commissioners and to uh, Kianor. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk to, um, a little bit about today was um, uh, the concept of polypharmacy, how it might impact um, uh, uh, insurance, and then most importantly, how it impacts patients. So, you know, just kind of just starting off, you know, one of the things that, you know, with polypharmacy that I see um, and why there is such an issue with this is because a, a common patient um, will uh, see multiple different physicians, dentists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, many other professions as well um, with prescribing powers. And you know, even specialists within the physician field, for example. And these physicians, they don't uh, commonly communicate with one another. Patients may also go to uh, multiple different pharmacies because one pharmacy um, might be offering a special um, that if you transfer a prescription there, you can get $15 off your groceries. I mean, it's a common thing. So what ends up happening is, is there's this, um, you know, there's this issue in, in, in pharmacy and in medicine where people are not being treated appropriately. And, you know, one of the biggest things there that you see, and the reason for it is because of the lack of communication between all of the different providers. Um, and, you know, then, then there's also the issue then, uh, not only are you seeing multiple providers in the large, dis in the large disparity and the lack of uh, communication with everybody, you also uh, will see the issues um, in, um, uh, with the insurance companies. You know, um, obviously um, everybody here and uh, online is familiar with the concept of a formulary. Uh, but, you know, um, in preparation for today, I really took a good look into you know, um, uh, exactly what the insurance companies do. And I mean, essentially what it is, is that, you know, there's, um, it's a mix of uh, running numbers. You know, um, each of your insurance companies are going to have probably um, one or two physicians, but a team of PharmDs that are going to be in there and they're going to make a judgment call as in terms of what medication may be better um, or good for uh, a particular patient. Um, there's some there's some inherent problems with that, because as as precision medicine moves forward, uh, and we start to take a look um, at the uh, genetics um, associated with patients, and you look at all of the different drug drug interactions, you know sometimes those more expensive medications, the ones that don't have the drug interactions, um, or the ones that don't cause the cognitive decline, or don't have you know for instance like. Uh, strong anticholinergic effects that can uh, cause memory impairment and uh, confusion in the elderly, um, the patients will get the cheaper medications um, because, you know, well, if there's something that happens, somebody in a little box somewhere has determined that it's more advantageous to, uh, to follow that route. Um, but unfortunately, what ends up happening is, is that there are a lot of patients that are, um, are getting hurt um, and or are not receiving optimal care. Um, so then what do they do? Um, kind of just circling back the whole way around, um, they will go to see more physicians to treat more side effects. And then the polypharmacy issue grows. And remember, I mean, each of these medications that the patients are taking, um, there are side effects. There are, um, uh, and it can also cause other conditions. So, you know, I mean, one of the things that I kind of really just, you know, wanted to bring up to light and kind of just throw out there today is, you know, some of the problems that we've been experiencing uh, for years. Um, and, you know, I think it can be, you know, will there ever be a fix for it? Probably not, but it could definitely get a lot better. You know, I mean, if it's, um, if one physician versus another, you know, and there's patients on different interacting meds, you know, you take away the egos for a half a minute and take a look at that patient as opposed to, well, I prescribed this for a reason, so you change it, you know. Um, uh, you know, so one, there's the ego issue. Two, 
there's the lack of communication. Three, you've got the insurance companies that obviously, you know, they are there to make money, but they don't, you know, they probably don't need to make as much. Um, and um, then, then finally, then coming back around, there's the issue of polypharmacy and it impacts the quality of living for the patients that each of us treat. So that was my, um, so um, that was my uh, top topics for today. Thank you. That's, that's very, very interesting. And uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, listening to you uh, lecture on, on this topic or around about it. And, and it's, it's, it's so important what you're saying. And on, on the, in the name of eagles, uh, sometimes eagles can, can hurt patients and sometimes uh, eagles can allow ourselves, each other, uh, including me, to get ahead of ourselves. So I, I'm a big believer in working uh, as a team. Uh, of course, healthcare is very um, diverse. Uh, there's, there's many subspecialties. So work with colleagues uh, in order to provide your patients with the utmost care that you possibly can uh, and put the ego aside. Uh, the other thing that I want to touch on about insurance companies, I mean, insurance companies and uh, all the tactics they, they use with many of us are sickening. Uh, stall tactics are common practice. I'm a big believer that in every dental slash medical practice, there is there's situations where doctors lose patients because of insurance companies misleading patients and not telling them the full story. And then that, that's got to stop because that's hurting our, uh, our reputations. It's hurting uh, potentially our relationships with our patients. And it's a no-no. So the, the, the one question, Dr. Kriak, that I'd like to maybe have you respond to, if you know the answer to, of course, is when we speak to insurance companies, when we have a question, when we have a denial, are, are, we, uh, are we speaking to a physician uh, or a doctor? Or are we speaking to, let's say, uh, 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 someone on the secretarial staff who is essentially giving us medical advice? You know, how does that work? So the way that it's supposed to work is that, um, you know, whenever you go to get one of these medications for a patient, um, you need to get what is known as a prior authorization um, for the medications where they have to actually approve it. You have to make a case. Um, so that the patient is then prescribed that particular medication. Um, the prior auth many of the prior year authorizations go are just transmitted electronically. Um, and then somebody on that end sends it to somebody and then they accept or deny. Um, one of the problems, one of the ultimate problems is, uh, and again, um, I see uh, Dr. Morris over there shaking his head, is that sometimes these prior auths can take quite a while. And, you know, then the needed medication that um, uh, is delayed in a particular patient, then in that time, they may be prescribed something suboptimal. And because there are many other patients with the same issues, then those patients might stay on that other med um, or um, eventually be changed. So, you know, is it, are we talking to somebody? Um, in, in many instances, no, it's an electronic um, transfer. Sometimes you do get to talk to somebody um, and um, you may also be able to talk to some, you, um, information, just as if you called, um, say, Dr. Morris at his office, you would be speaking to somebody at uh, the front desk who might relay that information to a nurse who will then eventually relay that to Dr. Morris. Um, but it's, it's probably a lot more complex of a process when dealing with the insurance companies. Doc, Dr. Morris, Morris uh, is shaking uh, his head. I, I'm, I'm going to go out of order a little bit and just have you briefly respond to what Dr. Kriak just brought up, if you don't mind. And then I'll return um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have Dr. Allen uh, update us. I thank you so much, Dr. Kostev. Uh, Dr. Kriak, thank you for your comments. Guys, thank you for, for having me here. Um, so yes, so to Dr. Craig's point, yes, the prior authorization is, is a huge part of medicine and it's a tedious part of medicine. And, and to be honest, a lot, some of it is necessary, a lot of it isn't. Um, if you, um, it, 
in my I've been practicing in, in Tucson for about over a decade. And a lot of the prior authorizations we get for medications, when the insurance company makes recommendations on alternatives to try, half the time it's not something that you would typically use for that particular issue the patient has. So it's almost like they're working with 1960s information to treat diseases in 2020 so, yeah. or 2021. So you, you find a lot of that disconnect. And honestly, to get someone on the phone uh, at, the, at the insurance company is literally like pulling teeth without anesthesia. <laughs> it's not fun. You know, you will, I mean, we've had staff members spend hours if cumulatively throughout a couple of days trying to get an actual person on the phone to sort out the issue. And the, the trick is once you do get someone of clinical background, you know, when I get on the phone with them and I say, hey, hey, here's, a, here's what's going on, A, B, C, D. It's, oh yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. And it makes you think, so why the holdup? You know, I mean, the same information was provided in, in text, but when, and, when and, it's a verbal. And if you think about it, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry for that. But no if you worries. think about it, when, when we are, especially the guys and ladies and gents uh, who have the bigger practices, who are uh, internists and who are, are basically relying on volume, much more so than a surgeon or a, a someone who sees less volume. But, but the point becomes you have to have staff that spends their whole time in your office waiting on the phone to communicate with an insurance representative. Uh, that uh, uh, causes your overhead to increase substantially. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And and, and yep. what's the what, why should we should we be forced to stay on hold for 20, 30 minutes at a time, sometimes even longer? Uh, you know, it's not it's not right. I mean, yeah. our time is certainly worth uh, oh, uh, a, you know a ton as a uh, much more than they give us. As any kind of uh, um, healthcare provider or healthcare specialist or someone with you know a, a bunch of acronyms after the name, I mean, it took us a while to get to where we are. It, 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 your your time is precious. And and honestly, come on, guys, let's face it, they know that. Uh, they, they know when you have a, like, like a large volume practice, you don't have the time to spend on the phone for half an hour to 40 minutes. I mean, you have three other clients waiting for you to get seen. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have some of those same notes, so I may echo some of the same sentiment as Dr. Kryak, but I'll, I'll reframe it so that way, you know, we can get newer ideas and throw it into the pot. But it's a good way to start. I, I like Dr. Kryak's um, 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 comment there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morris, for your comment. No worries. And Dr. Dr. Kriak, thank you for uh, uh, giving us your update. And ladies and gents, now I'd like to uh, turn my uh, attention to the good friend, Dr. Alan Chong. Again, as I intro uh, introduced him, he's here as in chiropractic medicine. And uh, he always has uh, much wisdom to share with us. And his topic today is uh, the stress of uh, disunified uh, professions. And I think that's a very important topic. And I'm gonna uh, guess this unified means a profession where there is lack of unity. There is, uh, um, yeah, people are sort of afraid to uh, come together and be friends. And instead of they see each other as competitors. And I guess uh, to a degree, competition is healthy, uh, but also we should never look, look at each other as being each other's enemies uh, in healthcare. Uh, because again, don't forget, we have one common uh, goal, and that is to treat effectively and uh, honestly and, and uh, uh, to the uh, standards of healthcare today, our patients. So Dr. Chong, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Krastev, and thank you, Kinar Shah, Dr. Shah, for uh, uh, creating goal, goal summits and, and even uh, appointing uh, members to, to this commission. So um, disunity, Particularly, I'm going to talk about the chiropractic profession, and I'd, I'd love to, after uh, a few minutes of chat here, have uh, uh, the other uh, commissioners chime in, because as our viewers, um, I want to give a little bit of background. Like, uh, if you remember, in the chiropractic profession, we were once ousted and not considered min mainstream, not so long ago, probably 25 years. I've been in practice 34 years now. So I've gone through the times where, you know, a medical doctor will not take my call um, just because I'm a chiropractor. Uh, uh, we couldn't refer to all kinds of uh, specialties. Now, fortunately, uh, in the evolution of, of healthcare, that has changed for the most part in the Western world. But chiropractic across the world is still uh, relatively unknown. So we, what's unique in chiropractic is that 
we're kind of like an underdog profession that has finally in the Western world, uh, certainly in the US and Canada and uh, the Western countries have uh, uh, been legislated, registered, licensed, acknowledged as doctors. And that's, that's great. However, within our profession itself, because of the extreme diversity of practice, and there are over 50 different techniques. So could you imagine that there's 50 at least different systems of dealing with a particular issue that just sets us up as a, as a, you know, a disunified profession. And then within that prof our profession, there are very mixed practices, which is, is great to see in some respects. And, and I'm expressing my opinion here, for example, uh, you will see in your communities now uh, chiropractic with physio, even with uh, medical practitioners combining uh, their efforts, which is, I think is great to see uh, various doctors uh, collaborating. But then you have uh, lone soldiers out there that are just plugging away traditional practice, if you will. So I, I think that's okay as well. Um, but when it comes to, th there's a, a unique philosophical and I ideologic uh, differences, which sometimes um, we, you know, I just can't agree with a colleague and that's okay too, because it might be that they're claiming that they're only working with the nervous system or they're only working with us or I only do uh, musculoskeletal practice. And that starts to become, become a problem because I'm right and you're wrong type of practice within a profession. So how do we deal with that as uh, a healthcare professional, as a doctor, I would say that if we simply um, took uh, poorly understood uh, practices and had the fundamental, as Dr. Shaw says, the Hippocratic, back to a Hippocratic oath, Hippocratic practice, what it is, do no harm and serve the patient. So in modern terms, what I'm talking about is unification of various doctors, uh, even across professions, with patient-centered care. Those three words. If we were, if imagine if insurance companies were interested in patient-centered care, wow, that would be almost revolutionary. Because we aren't talk, we are talking about cost containment to some degree. What's always baffled me in I, I hail from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So we are in a uh, we have universal health care here, um, uh, among other countries that have universal health care. When I bring that up to many uh, U.S. Um, doctors, there's very strong views about whether we should have universal health care or not. So we're not talking about the political aspect, and I don't want to talk about that. But imagine if we shifted and went back to patient-centered care. So if your treatment program that you're recommending or colleagues can be very, very different, but if it's patient centered and it's results oriented, um, then that is more acceptable certainly and, and should be ethical and professional. But we know there's the complete range of ethical and professional and borderline practices. So how are we going to unify doctors uh, globally is to have discussions like this to engage and to say, what can we do within our own profession? What can we do as a chiropractor contributing to a larger? That's why I love my, um, my involvement with the Hexilateral co Commission is, is six major professions getting together to have meaningful discussions about solutions and how to raise our standard of practice and influence others to do so as well. So the solutions that I propose are transparency in this in our scope of practices and having more consistent standards of practice. Imagine that. Well, there are several associations uh, within chiropractic. There's quite a few, but they tend to be philosophic and ideologic. So those who are totally research based practitioners, those are more philosophic, ideologic. And then there's fringe groups, right? And I don't know if you in uh, other professions, I'd like I'd love uh, uh, some dialogue as I wrap up but my, my throwing out of ideas and, and to acknowledge diversity if it is in the best interest of patient-centered care. If it's diversity just for the fact that 
I run a high volume practice. I've always run a high volume practice. I only need two minutes contact time with the client and that's what I do. Well, um, if the standard of care is there and there's, there's a, a reason to do what you do, regardless of who's paying for it, let's just assume in patient centered care that it's the patient that has to pay, um, then that, that forms a different model. Imagine if every single drug that you have, that you prescribe or don't uh, prescribe has to be paid for by the patient out of pocket. Well, that's a different world, isn't it? It's a different world. No insurance, cash practice only. Um, that's utopian, but I'm going to su uh, suppose that. And then eliminate what doesn't work. And we, and that's another topic for another time where it's science-based uh, guidelines only. Uh, of course, the, the holy grail used to be, and I say used to be because it's being challenged, randomized controlled studies. Well, you cannot possibly um, do a double blind study on every single procedure and process that you do. We know that as clinicians, but um, the, the new, new standard appears to be shifting to research informed care. So in other words, doctors are still doctors as opposed to strict clinical guidelines. You cannot do this, you cannot do this, and then you can only do this. So there's Dr. Krestev, that, there, those are my food for thoughts. Disunity among professions, especially uh, the unique, unique ones in the chiropractic profession, because we're starting to grow up. As always, I always learn something from you. Dr. Litran, what uh, uh, perhaps can you um, uh, uh, add to what uh, Dr. Allen just uh, discussed? What, what's your view of this? I don't know what he's talking about, because we dentists, we get along just fine. <laughs> every single one i'm sure <laughs> well you know i think um I, I, no I, but i i didn't mean it in that sense i mean i i appreciate the humor i mean we all have a sense of humor but well, the question we, is uh, uh, to to a degree i think there's no way uh, a particular practitioner can be an expert in every single uh, area that that uh, that, that is either in medicine or dentistry or whatever, pharmacy, you know, we, uh, each one of us has a limitation. And I think what Alan, maybe, maybe I misunderstood a little bit what to one of the points that he's making is, but it is the fact that uh, the healthcare is, is treating one big system, the human body. And that human body uh, is, as we all know, extremely complex. And sometimes the layperson can look at what we do and say, well, it's just a tooth, it's just a foot, it's just this, it's just my little back pain. But, but you know what? Ultimately, you back in your tooth and everything else happens to be attached to one big clunk of meat called your body. So we have to uh, 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 properly treat that body. And there's no wrong in, 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 in asking your friends, asking your colleagues, not just asking them their opinion, but rather uh, consulting to use their professional services with whatever specialty uh, they may uh, help you with. So from that perspective. Yes, uh, so I'm, yeah, I, I was just messing around there. But, um, you know, Dr. Dr. Chong, and this is something that I will uh, uh, touch a little bit uh, when it's my turn to talk about dentistry specifically and just our healthcare in general, it is the fact that the communication um, has to happen, and a lot of it is on you, right? So, for example, let's say, um, let's say I want to to put it out there. Let, let me just give a quick example in dentistry. Let's say I'm a general general dentist. So, yes, I'm not the same as the oral surgeon who who went through four to six years, or sometimes eight years, to get to where he's at, right? And I decide to place implants, which is it used to be where only oral surgeon can do. If I want to reach out and communicate with them and let them know that I'm not stepping on their toes, I'm going to do my particular part, maybe what I should be talking to them about is not specifically about implant, but maybe it could be about patient care, right? Patient management. Find something that is similar to start sharing with them where they start listening to you, and then you start educating them that these are the things that, you know, they should look at where it's going to you know, we're just going to be adding one more part to taking care of the patient. Like somebody like Dr. Morris, 
is not going to do specifically what you do, Dr. Chong, but you can certainly collaborate, right? But they Absolutely. shouldn't be looking. They shouldn't be looking at you and say, "Well, they're not a real doctor," or whatever it is that they well, it that used they to be say. That which, way for sure, right? It, it, but it, it really comes from being ignorant, right? Because you're not, you're not. They don't know enough, or they maybe they feel uncomfortable, they feel threatened. But what I'm trying to say is the education part has to come from from you, right? From the profession, but, for sure. Yes, absolutely. Yes, but don't come. But don't start with the. With, don't start with them by saying. Well, I'm treating the same body like you. Start with something else. So start with something that they can agree with you, sure. which is patient care, right? Give the patient a, yeah. a big, a, that kind of a thing. And then once they start listening to you, then they'll accept you. I, I have a, I have a friend who uh, came up with a system that it took him several years to get his article published in a in a specialist uh, uh, magazine. And I knew him from when he started working on it until we actually got it in. And now he's teaching the specialist his particular system. So I, I can see that it, it, it's a process, but it has to come from you is what I'm trying to say. You know, one thing I wanna, say, I wanna mention here, and this is, I believe, very important. Unless we communicate with each other and communication, 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 it's like real estate, real estate, real estate, location, location, location. If we don't communicate with the specialties around us, we perhaps may not know a particular treatment exists if we're not familiar with it. And if we don't hear what our colleagues that are experts in their particular fields, you know, what they may share with us. And I would so, say likewise, Dr. Krestev, uh, to wrap this up is, uh, you know, you as an internist, you as a general uh, uh, physician or dentist, headaches issues or whatever it is, call a, a, a well-respected chiropractor in your neighborhood and say, hey, you know, do you think you can help this patient? I've heard that you deal with this just as well. I welcome that. And I think that is the type of collaborations we want to see. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys for your comments there. And now I, uh, I'd like to uh, invite the infamous and famous and the one and only champion in the battlefield, gentleman with the ladies and the man with so many feathers in his head, Dr. Pritin Deer Singh. And his topic is um, uh, insurance versus patient versus the doctor. Welcome, Dr. Singh, and pleasure to have you, my friend. Hey, Dr. Pavel, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm, I'm audible enough? Yeah, I hear you fine. We are great. So a uh, big hello and hugs to all the commissioners and uh, a lovely day to the audience right here. Uh, a very delicate topic allotted to me regarding uh, philosophy related to insurance companies versus patients versus uh, doctors. So, you know, uh, these uh, insurance companies, uh, I'm talking about the present, and uh, we, these three, the patients, the doctors and insurance companies, they are very much related uh, at present. And uh, uh, the commissioners already know what we're talking about, but for the audience, I would like to say that there is a difference between healthcare versus health insurance. What is healthcare? They, they are often uh, confused by a patient uh, uh, using these two terms interchangeably. Healthcare is not health insurance, and health insurance is not healthcare, my dear colleagues. Healthcare is uh, uh, an effort to maintain or restore mental, physical, or emotional well being by licensed and trained professionals like we doctors that's that's healthcare and when we talk of health insurance it is a system of financing used for medical expenses which are given by us so it's a design to help absorb or offset healthcare costs associated with a wide range of services like specialist referral visits prescription medicines etc and health insurance policies are generally uh, you know, uh, uh, classified as uh, individual, commercial, or uh, uh, any beneficial package. Uh, you know, I would like to mention here, before the insurance companies, there was something in 1940s. Uh, if we talk of US, there was something known as prepaid physician groups, or also known as prepaid doctor groups. So this existed before the insurance. The, uh, the prepaid groups used to offer inexpensive care uh, and the physician acted as their own insurers. 
patients had a monthly fee directly to the group rather they are giving to an insurance company so rather than we go uh, as uh, dr morris said we don't have time for 30 minutes to just uh, cling on to the phone to ask them uh, or get clearance what treatment we have to plan what uh, what clearance we are getting about the treatment rather we we this we have the decision we have the diagnosis we can start the treatment right away and with our own minds uh, rather than to be dictated by an insurance company and uh, ordering unnecessary tests and procedures should be drained away uh, you know the group resources what we have if we are charging a minimal amount from a patient versus a major uh, amount to give to insurance company we use it in the very necessary test uh, we want to do and rather than uh, we uh, end up uh, lose uh, patients by uh, you know interacting so much uh, wasting time with the insurance companies till the patient is uh, fed up so uh, but what happened was the the american medical association uh, they uh, opposed the prepaid doctor groups after 1950s they were afraid that self insuring would eventually evolve into healthcare corporations so ama thought that these doctors are going to turn into health corporations so the concept of uh, medical insurance really evolved as a uh, you can say in a bureaucratic hierarchy so ama officials started uh, threatening some working uh, group prepaid groups that uh, let's not license your brands Uh, as a group practice uh, let there be various authorities who can be known as insurance companies whom you can deal with and they can finance the uh, treatment if the patient is paying and thus came the birth of the insurance company model and uh, during uh, uh, the past 20 years uh, it's really going quite along with the insurance companies but uh, uh, audience it's not an easy task for a doctor to establish a relationship between the patient and the insurance company till we till we get an approval for the certain treatment and uh, you know sometimes there is a defeat the patient gets uh, 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 really fed up of the time gap in between if you understand uh, we are there to Uh, provide you treatment for an insurance setup we need to have uh, various other staff members let's say if we are talking of a small practice versus a large practice so you know uh, having a lot of staff uh, to you know deal with the insurance companies let's say about a small clinic it's very tough for a small clinic to deal with the insurance companies listen to their uh, you know demands listen to their treatment plans listen to their unnecessary tests what we are going to uh, you know uh, carry out so uh, a large hospital i can still say uh, uh, they can uh, they do have some staff uh, uh, administrative staff who can deal with the insurance companies but if you uh, if you compare the ratio between the small and the large hospitals a smaller portion of clinics also uh, there is a very large proportion so here uh, uh, my uh, statement would be uh, insurance companies they are in doctors so why do we keep letting them practice medicine at every call a non medical uh, a person dealing with insurance is telling me uh, to do this to do this do you even know what you're talking about you just know the term you just you just quoted me uh, uh, you know i've been doing research and methodology since uh, uh, past 12 years and i am noting that uh, an, a non medical person is just Uh, known to a medical term he doesn't know the depth of it we have wasted not wasted we have utilized our uh, you know eight to 10 precious years in medicine so uh, second uh, statement of mine are insurance companies driving doctors out of the profession yes to an extent very true they are uh, in may, uh, in developed countries insurance companies are you know taking a major hold and uh, driving doctors out of the profession they already have some framed treatment plans before the uh, before we talk to them so uh, uh, th this is not giving me uh, or you uh, a happy uh, profile of the treatment uh, there was a survey conducted of 600 doctors in us 600 i am telling you 600 is a very major number for high number of physicians and 89% of these physicians said they have no adequate influence uh, in the healthcare decision for their patients so the question was who is the influencing party 
They are saying as insurance companies, they are telling us to prescribe individualized treatments rather than one treatment goal. They are telling us to break down the treatments into various aspects and uh, plan our treatment accordingly. So uh, gentlemen, morning I leave uh, 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 home to do a practice, to do a procedure, and certainly I, I'm guided by uh, these persons to do the procedure stepwise or in a various uh, other sequence. I'm not uh, uh, going to uh, do the treatment uh, according to them. So this leads to frustration in the doctor, in the patient's mind, and you know, uh, you, you certainly have in mind uh, uh, a perception of uh, uh, whom do you want to keep the happy, the insurance company or the patient? Oh, uh, again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a panacea of uh, various thoughts. And, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about cancer patients. They require a very personalized treatment, which can be very critical to the survival. So those suffering from conditions like various autoimmune disorders, uh, uh, blindness, or et cetera, they, uh, they, uh, their approach should be appropriate. The treatment approach has to be appropriate. But when we deal with these companies, our approach starts from inappropriate to appropriate. So this is how uh, we are guided uh, by more than, uh, you know, uh, many factors behind it, which is uh, uh, quite debatable uh, here. Sorry if I'm uh, a, a bit uh, uh, very vocal about this uh, perception of uh, uh, insurance companies' pressure on our minds as well as on the patient's mind, but we have to uh, implement uh, something uh, like, like a step therapy, like uh, negotiating some drug prices, as uh, uh, Dr. Allen mentioned, that we need to uh, see something about our, uh, the pricing pattern, the, the uh, you know, John Craig also mentioned about the pricing pattern of the medicines. Yes, we are not going to, we shouldn't be dealing with these uh, uh, grocery coupons with uh, uh, healthcare medicines. Uh, you know, again, that's not we, we who are dealing with it. It's the partner, uh, the partner companies with the insurance which are dealing with uh, that. So from the philosophical point of view, I would uh, like to say that uh, the healthcare uh, should be uh, okay. I don't uh, uh, really appreciate the pressure put put uh, put uh, on us by the companies. Let's let's not be dictated by them. They are just there to help patients by uh, financing their projects, but let's not be uh, get dictated. Let's 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 uh, let the three uh, factors that is the patients, the doctor, as well as the insurance company, uh, uh, we three be happy as uh, single entities. Or if 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 they can't tolerate, uh, if the insurance companies can't tolerate a doctor's treatment plan or a patient's perspective, uh, rather I would say let's let's drop down to 1940s where there was a group practices or I am my own master to decide. So, so, uh, so may, may I interject, Dr. Singh? Sure. If we simply went back to en masse that the patient pays and they can claim it back otherwise, they will choose the most uh, practical care that they can afford. And, and I have this. We, we are mostly a cash, cash practice. So uh, people choose, people that say they first cannot afford what I've recommended come up with the money, uh, and some can't, you know, it, it's, but healthcare is a business and insurance companies are a business, as you know, as we all know, and that is the big issue. But if we, as globally, as en masse said, uh, we're cutting you out, third parties, we don't take third party anymore. It would be a huge paradigm shift. It would take a bold shift and it might hit the bottom line, Dr. Emily and others, for quite a while, but imagine that. So I'm just going to throw it out there. So uh, when we get too reliant on on the third party to pay us, that's where we get bound. Well, I think uh, just, I, I think it's, just go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, just really uh, one point. Yeah. Uh, this is the latest statement from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I was uh, reading about. I just want to say that line: Physicians, hospitals meet their new competitor insurer owned clinics now this is coming up insurer owned clinics earlier we were like uh, insurer insurer and panel clinics 
Now it is insurer own clinics. So my dear friends, they're jumping the, to the next step uh, uh, from empanelment to their own clinics. So uh, comments are welcome, Dr. Pell. Well, I think one, one thing that I can draw away from here in, in, in one sentence is that, you know, uh, we shouldn't allow insurance companies to control or dictate the, the health care we provide our patients. Uh, because insurance companies, as Alan mentioned, they are in this uh, to make money. They are uh, in business to make money. And I hate to say this, but I, I, I don't know too many insurance companies that actually care about a patient or their patients. We as doctors, we are the opposite. We're in a different pole. We, we, we care to provide patient health care. And that means the best uh, health care. That means health care uh, currently uh, that is being judged to be the standard of care in our respective professions. So this is a huge, uh, huge problem. And, 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 and unfortunately, uh, uh, some patients uh, either can or cannot uh, uh, understand the way the system works. And then, I mean, all of us hear this, this thing, doc, I have the best insurance, doc, I have the best insurance, they cover everything. Then you check their plan out and you realize, you know, all they cover is the profit and, you know, the exam to look in someone's mouth and give them, you know, a little consultation. Okay, and then the rest, when you get to the big things, they give you coverage of, let's say, $1,000 or $2,000 uh, of annual coverage. As you guys know, in dentistry especially, uh, with uh, an annual coverage of $2,000, when you start talking full mouth or rehab cases, the big reconstructions that are uh, scores of, of uh, thousands of dollars, you know, what is, what is $2,000? And then, you know, this, these patients, when they are sold their plans, uh, I don't think they really explain the fine print of what they're buying, you know, and, and that drives me nuts. But, you know, it's for all of us and the future of our colleagues to start focusing uh, this and, and discussing it more openly so that we can perhaps steer the profession and healthcare in a positive direction uh, where the autonomy is returned to us, the healthcare providers, where so, we can, yeah, please, Jared. Yeah, so um, to, to Dr. Dr. Pratinda's point, I, 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 do love, I do love his passion. I love what he's saying about going back to the way it was. And I think that would be a good thing for us to do. Uh, but it all starts, I believe, with educating those of us who are going into the field on business. Let's face it, I don't know about you guys, I think I may have said this a couple of weeks or a couple of months ago, you know, in conversations to a few of you, I mean, most of us do not get business knowledge when you go through, whether it's medical school, dental school, optometry school, chiropractor school. I mean, we even, you know, whether you do a PhD or PharmD, we all need some level of basic basic understanding of business and if and and if if more as we grow if we are able to reach to the generation beneath us because i mean by and large people in our who are practicing now a few of them will begin to latch on to the idea of becoming a business but those coming up are the ones we need to tap and say hey if you're coming into this race here are the things you need to be able to do and I know, you know, Dr. Dr. Shah and Dr. and Dr. Latran have something great that we're building towards, which I think is gonna help plug that 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 knowledge gap. And a lot of specialists, physicians, dentists, optometrists, pharmacies, you name it, you know, a chiropractic have that gap with regards to the knowledge of how to run a successful business. Because we we in medicine, we take insurance because we think that's the only way that we can make a living. You know, but when you if you're given the tools and you can say, well, you know what? I don't really need to take that. You know, because of my skill set, I can offer A, B, C, D and still live comfortably. I mean, I don't want to, you know, have a private jet or anything, but I want to be able to live comfortably and pay off my, my loans as we all do. You know, yeah. I, I think knowledge is key, being able to have that business acumen. And once you don't have to have be, you know, someone running a Fortune 500 company, but you, the basics we should be able to get. And I'll touch on that too, a little bit more in my time. I, I like to just make a quick comment, um, Dr. Dr. Singh. We could we could feel your fire from across the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And and thank you for that because when you talk like that with a patient, the patient can understand that you care, right? I yeah, I understand you have. I don't know what insurance you have, but this is I care about you, and it's only between me and you. So I would just want to make two comments. The first one, when you're talking about insure, um, 
insurer clinics. It's already happening in America. Kaiser has their own medical school. So now what, imagine if nobody enrolled in the, in the medical school, right? So that would be us letting our younger uh, colleagues know, you know what, don't go to Kaiser Medical School, go to your traditional school because the Kaiser Medical, medical School will teach you their model. And then they would give you the job. Uh, my daughter is in, she's gonna start third year uh, dental school at UCLA and guess who sponsor Lunch and Learn all the time? The DSOs, they would come, but but if I want to come in and talk about business, I can. Right? <laughs> but a DSO can sponsor the lunch and learn, and so these kids are already they already get familiar with the DSO. So that's that's point number one is we are the educate ourselves, which is what Dr. Morris said. The second thing I think, which is a bigger part, is we have to take the time, and it may not be your time as a as a physician or doctor, you know, as a, as a provider, it has to be your staff time, or maybe you're going to be sending out emails, or maybe you're going to have a handout to your patient, and you explain that insurance stuff to them. So they can't just come in and say, I have the best insurance. No, you don't, right? I, and just on a personal note, and maybe I shouldn't say this online, I actually got into trouble with an insurance company because I'm fighting them. I was fighting them, and it, and it took like, it basically exploded, but I was fighting them. It was a smaller insurance company, but I was fighting them because I was dictating where I want to send my patient. I was telling my patient, don't listen to them. I was telling my patient, no, you got to go back and, and tell them, no, you want to go here. And this is the treatment that you want. And it has nothing to do with the insurance. And I'm not saying that everybody should get into that kind of situation. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you, we have to educate ourselves and we have to educate our patient. And then you leverage the patient to go and talk to the insurance company because the patient is the one paying the premium. And the, and the insurance always tell the patient, well, you know, we're paying your doctor. And we're not really supposed to say, well, they're paying us $1,000, like what Dr. Grastev was saying, right? Because we don't want to make the conversation about money. We want to make the conversation about treatment yeah. and, put, and put the patient first. But to, but to your point, Emily, I'll jump in. The, we, do need to, we do need to get the patients to begin to do something because the whole, I have, once it, once it, I have the best insurance, I mean, right. I, I, I'm always going to buff that back and like, no one has the best insurance. No one, <laughs> you know, I, I'm always going to buff it back, you know, and say, no, no. I mean, you don't understand the nitty gritty and the fine tuned points to the insurance plan that we have to deal with. And of course, you know, as, as a practice, you, like you said, you don't want to get caught up in the weeds of, 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 of haggling over price. You don't want to do that. You just want to do what you're trained to do, you know, but letting the patients know, I think at, on some level, we have to let them know, hey, you know what? This really isn't covered because of, you know, section C in your insurance plan. Call them, call them and ask them. Call them and ask them and see exactly what they say. And, and call them and make sure you use this word. Tell them you want to do ABC for XYZ and see what they say. And 90% they come back, Doc, you were right. It's not, I'm like, yeah, yeah. But you see, the patients don't know what to ask. So they just feel like, you know, if I pay my $10 a month um, 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 or my, my copay, my 10 bucks, I can get the world. No, you can't get the word for 10 bucks. Doesn't right. and, and we actually tell the patient, <clears throat> no, we are not going to call them <laughs> because it's going to take 45 minutes. So you call, <laughs> you call them, right? I don't call them. And, and when I first started, yes, we call them for the patient. Now I just say, no, we're not calling them. You go call them. This is the code. You go tell them. And then I'll just reschedule you. And, and it's frustrating for the patient, but it also tells the patient that the patient it's your insurance. You need to understand it. You need to be the one talking to your insurance. And, and on that side note, you know, if, if it takes up too much of our time, maybe consider using a VA, which is, these are the things that we talk about when we, when we um, teach the doctors how to do the healthcare business. But yeah, use a VA so you don't have to use your own staff time all the time. And then at the same time, um, leverage the patient, tell the patient to call. When the patient is on hold for 30 minutes, they're not going to ask you to call for them anymore because now they know that you're telling them the truth. That is so. So, that, so the that example is such that an I... amazing point. I'm sorry. That is such an amazing point that Dr. Emily just mentioned. Did you guys hear her well? Because patients have uh, usually a uh, in I guess years ago a booklet. Now they I'm sure it's all online, but they have a way to find out exactly what type of coverage they have. So why should we dedicate our time? I mean, our time has to be focused on patient care. 
to the maximum that we can. Uh, you know, people need to educate themselves what type of coverage they have, what is covered, what is not, to what degree. And, 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 and you know, and, and then you have a, a, a better understanding of what's going on. Now, you know what I love today, guys, ladies and gents? When I say guys, I'm talking about everyone. Okay, just, you know, it's been an issue before, so I want to clarify. Guys means ladies and gentlemen and everybody, everybody. I mean, everybody's included. Uh, what I love that we did a little differently uh, on this uh, public hex meeting is that we seem to be having the, uh, the, the round table as the show is going on. And I'm loving it. You know, I don't know about you guys, but Oh, did I say guys again? Bad habits, bad habits. You know, I'm liking it the way. So let's let's keep it going this way. And uh, uh, after we uh, uh, hear Dr. Trong and her presentation today, I, I highly recommend let's just keep it up till the end of the show with this tempo because it's great. You know, we seem to be conversing uh, exactly of what is being discussed, and you know, it's uh, let's let's continue in the fun. So uh, thank you, Dr. Emily, for your comment, uh, Dr. Gerald and um, uh, Dr. Chong. Now I'd like to uh, uh, say hi to uh, our dear friend, Dr. Trong, who uh, represents optometry. Uh, welcome, Susan, to the show. And uh, please, uh, you have a very uh, interesting uh, topic, which is called the uh, empathetic communication. Now, as we all know, communication is the key to everything. Uh, Marriage-wise, business-wise, you know, I mean, I, I yes to death my wife every single day. I tell her yes, honey, to everything. So, so that's communication. Lesson 101, say yes to your wives and then go do whatever the heck you want to do. Susan, welcome. Please, you have the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pablo and Dr. Kinoa for, for having me and for being part of this. It's such an honor. And it's, it's a pleasure listening, listening to, to everyone, right? To all my colleagues here in all the different disciplines. Common threads. What's a common thread? Communication. Here's what I always say whether in my personal life, my professional life, to the staff, to patients, clear, concise communications, minimizes misunderstanding, okay? And, 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 and minimizes any, or even eliminate any issues of any type, communication. So we have that common thread all across the dis different disciplines that we practice here. Patient-centric, how many times have you heard that? It's all about the patients. I sometimes I'll hear staff whining about whether, okay, let's remember why we are here. It's not about me, it's not about you. Our patients, patient-centric. Um, another thing, the whole insurance, oh my gosh, I think we can go on and on. You know, I, I'm listening and I'm like, yes, I'm here going like this. <laughs> but it is, but is, is it not? I mean, I mean it's, it's very, so when I talked about, um, again, we talk about patient-centric and another topic, Right, in, in terms of, of uh, Dr. Dr. Allen, Dr. Jerry, uh, Dr. John, Dr. Emily, and, and Dr. Pretender is um, the, the patient-centric. The, another thing is uh, we were talking about, okay, we're here to take care of patients and then insurance the, in the business of running a business. Well, so are we, but here's how we prioritize it, right? First and foremost, yes, it is tending to our patients, but then we do, we do have a business to run. I mean. Come on now, yes, would we love to give free care to all of our patients? Yes, but yes, we've got overhead, we've got the staff, we da, 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 and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so yeah, we have a business to run here too, so let's not forget that. So when me, gosh, there's so many topics I can speak upon, but what I've chosen today in terms of effective and empathetic communications, before I continue, uh, Dr. Allen, I'm here with you, and here's what I mean, as an optometrist, until yes. maybe just recently, we're not considered real doctors. Optometrists with our counterparts of ophthalmologists, the, the respect hadn't been there. We're, we're gaining a little more respect through, through the years and the last decades. I, and, and why and how? I don't expect to just get that respect. I know I, we optometrists, we, it is for us to earn it. And going back to Dr. Emily, um, she talked about the ignorance. Okay, it's me to educate others. What's the difference? Uh, uh, optometrist, ophthalmologist, what's the difference? I do get that question with patients. So I take that opportunity to educate, right? To, to share with them the differences. And it's like, yes, we, we are real doctors. Our education, here, here's what we had to go through, da, 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 right? undergrad, grad school, uh, 
residency, da, 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 da. Um, so yes, education. So in terms of getting back to communications, th there's two, two areas. One is communicating with colleagues in my, just my profession, my discipline, palm tree, but, it's, but, but why does it have to stop there? But it's with colleagues in any disciplines, all of you representing, all right? So again, when we can have the better, again, it's not, we've heard this many times, it's not what I say, it's how I say it, whether it's verbal, written, texting, emails, and we hear many times also, common sense, not so common. Common courtesy, not so common. Okay, maybe I'm just, I like, I, it seems like all of you pretty similarly. Traditional, conservative, old fashioned, common courtesy, politeness, it's a really big deal. So when I, I'm looking at communication, okay, I'm just gonna tell you something. And, and it's interesting because Dr. Kunor and Dr. Pavel will know when, when we have in, in our, when we have our conversation, right, in our messages, and there's a whole bunch of us and all, you'll, you'll hear very little from me, but I'm one of those where when I do say something, it's, I say something. But we need to understand, okay, when it's all in caps, you're yelling. So just don't forget that, please, okay? <laughs> so when I hear, I, I see all in caps, I'm like, oh my God, why, why are you yelling? Why do you need to yell, okay? So just kind of FYI on that. So again, not what we say, how we say it, not only to one another. And then when it comes to communications, listen here, as an optometrist, we are considered primary eye care physician. What does that mean? Ideally, recommendation in dentistry is recommended, it's, it's, it's been drilled, right? Your visit should be every six months, just like um, physician in general practice and your, your general care, right? Your, your physical once a year. Okay, with us optometrists, eye exam once a year. We try to drill it into them. We try to get them, the patients into this routine, but do they all follow that? Mm, not necessarily. However, when you come in, because here, here is this, this, this perception or this uh, stereotyping as optometrists. This is what I do all day. Click, click, what's better, one or two. Here's your prescription for glasses, for contacts. Thanks, see you next year. No. Okay, it's beyond that, of course, how, and I mentor newbies, new grads too. You can, you choose to be like that. You are how you choose to practice. That, that doesn't define, that doesn't have to define you because that's not all we've taught, right? This is here. This is the whole machinery we're taking care of, okay? Because as a pometrist, and we take a thorough history too, many patients, sometimes they get, eh, not many, but two or a few numbers. Why, why, why do you ask all these questions? You're just an eye doctor. Why do you care? Why does it matter? So I tell patients, are you just a set of eyeballs sitting in my chair? In my exam chair, are you? You're not, right? You are a whole, okay? I'm gonna take this holistic approach to you, what you eat, what you drink, medications you take, side effects, how you stress, how you not stress, how you sleep, et cetera. That's gonna affect. And right now, how you're sitting here in my exam chair, Okay, your state of mind, physical, mental, emotional, is going to affect the outcome of the, you know, your results, your, your prescription. But it's not just prescription. I'm not here. Yes, I'm here to get you the best prescription so you can have that 2020 greatest sight. But it's all about your eye health also. Okay, because God forbid, let's make sure there's not any diseases in front and back. Okay, let's make sure everything's all nice and healthy, just like the rest of your body. When you go to your, your doctor, okay, your primary care, your PCP, they want to make sure you're healthy in and out. So as a general eye care physician, if everything's good, great. Here's your clean bill of health. I'm going to see you next year. If not, heaven forbid, if you need a specialist, whether it's a corneal specialist, a retinal specialist, cataract surgery, etc. again, the communication, that, back to communication. I'm going to make sure I communicate well, clear, concise to what my patients need when I'm referring them out. Because you see, I expect that back and forth. I refer out, you're going to, your office is going to back to me and say, thank you. We share this mutual patient. Thank you for sending the patient. Here's what we found. I agree. I disagree, whatnot. And here's the uh, treatment plan. Da, 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 da. Because I tell patients, listen here, all of us, and I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not telling you anything any of you don't already know, because in the US, right, type 2 diabetes, 
such an epidemic. And people don't realize, yes, you can go blind. Why? Right? Because many primary care physicians, they're like, hey, did you go get your eyes checked for the year? Ta-da. And I would ask them, hey, why? Do you know why? Do you know why your doctor said you need to? Nope, they just said go ahead. So then again, back to Dr. Emily, educating, educating, educating. This is why. Here's what you need to do to prevent going blind. Because you once you get there, it's tough to reverse. So let's not get there in the first place. So I explain to patients, all of us doctors, primary care, optometry, your pharmacist, your, your retinal specialist, any, all of us, we all work together as a team, this team that communicates well so we can take care of you the best we can. Okay, so when, and the, so there's that clear, concise communication, but then when we come to being empathetic, yes, I, I, don't, I like to think many of us that are doctors, we are doctors because we're pretty darn awesome at empathy. Right? Empathy, putting yourself in that position, you know, in reverse role reversal, I said, and understanding what's going on, how that patient's feeling, what they're going through. Because we do this, I, I, I'll just speak for myself as a photometrist, as I train new ones. We, we do oftentimes, it's like, okay, you're, you know, you're the 10th patients I've seen today, right? But, and it, it may be almost too routine for us. Right? And it's like, okay, it's not a big deal. You've got this problem, we're gonna fix it. But you gotta remember, it's the patient's first time sitting there, right? And what are they afraid of? Going blind, bottom line, that's pretty scary. And when I can properly communicate effectively and with empathy, it's going to calm them down, ease them a bit, and then go from there. And just taking time and really truly just being a doc from the heart, right? It's just totally from here. Okay. And then, and Dr. Paul said, look, communications, right? But their communications in the home front with our, our significant other communication with our staff. Uh, yes, it's just to, to really, truly be aware, right? Have that self-awareness of how, how we're coming across. Because sometimes we get so wrapped up and we, we don't realize and we come across as whether too abrupt or too harsh or too like this but we got to really catch yourself. I know I was guilty of that at first. And after 20 plus years of practicing in different life events, I'm like, okay, all right, Susan, you know, you've got to really dial it back a bit. And another thing I've come to realize in terms of communicating with patients and as an optometrist, I enjoy taking care of patients from, from one end, when I say one end, the young ones, the peds, the pediatrics there to the other end, the geriatrics and everything in between. And here's something I've come to learn is Earlier, there was some talk on ego, okay? All right, we've got to set that ego aside. And here's what I mean by ego and communications. I'm the doctor. I communicate at this level. You as patient, I expect you to come to this level. After so long of practicing now, I've come to realize, no, that's, that's not effective on how I grow my practice or how I care for my patients. I need to get to the level of where my patient, where they're at whether it's that young patients and I, I need to be on the floor chasing after them huh? or this other patient, whether there's a language barrier, I got to slow. You, so you, you understand where I'm talking about when I say getting to their level? I'm not saying dumbing it down, insulting their intelligence. It's really what do we do all day when we work with the public? We read patients, right? I tell my husband, he doesn't work with the public. He's retired now from corporate America, but I tell him, this is what I do. I am blessed to work with patients from one end to the other, from the rich to the poor and everything in between. And I get to read. When I can read them, I know I'm gonna adjust myself to them, their personality, and to work and be better and be more effective as a doc communicating so I can meet their needs. And that you know, it, it, it's amazing. It's amazing, Susan. And I apologize if I stepped on you at the end. Oh, please. Uh, please. It, it's amazing what you just said. And here's why. Uh, when I, uh, ex before I even examine a patient, I always walk in the room and I say, hi, I'm going to first go over your medical history. And usually they say, why? You're going to fix my tooth. Then I, to the ones who ask, I explain to them that your head is attached to your body and your body is a complex, you know, piece of art, et cetera. Most of them understand. And, but, but I make it very clear when I go over the medical history with a patient that initially I am not talking about your dental history because that's the scope of my profession. I'm talking about the overall system attached to your head. Let's talk about that first. 
Then I clearly tell the patients, now I'm going to do your oral evaluation and check what's going on, dentally speaking, and then we'll talk about everything. But one very important point that I wanna make, especially to our younger, less experienced colleagues, we do blood pressure checks on every patient. Uh, and and I, I can't tell you guys uh, how often we have patients who, when we ask them, how, when was the last checkup you had 10 years ago, six years ago? When was the last time you saw a physician? Seven years ago. How's your blood pressure? Oh, it's great. So a lot of these people are walking time bombs for a stroke or a heart attack or et cetera, because they have uh, malignant you know, hypertension. It's not the white coat syndrome. It's not just being scared of the dentist that day or, or the surgeon or whatever they're gonna have done. A lot of people walking around with undiagnosed hypertension and you guys are the first line of defense to possibly uh, perhaps even save their life. It's, it's, uh, I don't mean to um, give us dentists a lot of credit, but, but, but do the blood pressure check. Uh, it, it's, it's imperative, you know, uh, that's a silent killer. And uh, then we refer patients to Dr. Uh, Morris for treatment. Yes. And whenever I see Dr. Morris and me going like this together, that's a good thing, guys. You know, so Dr. Uh, Truong, thank you so much and um, uh, appreciate the comments. And now we'll give, we're running a little bit uh, uh, back on time. So I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Emily Latron as she represents our profession dentistry and uh, uh, her uh, her topic today is how to stand out against uh, big corporations you know how do you how do you distinct yourself and your way of practicing to uh, to be uh, competitive in today's society so dr Latron uh, please uh, enlighten us with your knowledge and experience well thank you so much it's my absolute honor to be here um, so I'm a practicing dentist in Southern California I've been practicing for almost three decades I have uh, two multi um, specialty group practices, and we take different insurances, which is why I have some insights in insurance. And I, I believe that it's absolutely our choice whether or not we take insurance. Um, if we choose to do that, we need to understand how it works. We need to understand ourselves. We need to educate our patients. And I'm, uh, before I get to that topic, I would like to take a couple of moments to share a couple of slides uh, about the um, Global Summit Institute um, project and what we do. So I'm gonna share my slide first to talk about it. This might, hold on. Let me back out, I don't. Let me share, go back to sharing the screen again. It's, So this is the one I want to share. So we at the Global Summit Institute, one of the projects we're working on is the Doctorate of Healthcare Business. And this program is designed to teach doctors from all different disciplines, uh, medicine, dentistry, chiropractic, optometry, pharmacy, philosophy, teaching the doctors how to do business. I'm gonna play a quick video. Oops. Quick video. Uh, Dr. Latron? Yeah, maybe try sharing the screen, Emily. There we go. That's what I thought I was doing.
Okay. Did that did that video play okay? It played, but I believe it was a little bit blurry. Uh, I, I don't know what you guys in your ends, but uh, it seemed a little bit blurry. I don't know if it loaded properly. It's all good. Okay. All well, good. Uh, okay, good. It's all fine. So, um, the, so basically the program that we have is, is um, it has three tracks and the three tracks are financial, which is learning about your personal finance, learning how to control your debt, um, learning how to increase your cash flow, learning how to leverage your money to do investment, uh, maybe creating intellectual property, holding patterns. Emily, uh, so you I'm sorry. can leverage your knowledge. Can you try to uh, go full screen because I don't I don't think uh, you're full screen. I'm not full screen. It's not in presentation mode, basically. Right. Right. Okay. Well, can okay? Can you can you still see it though? It's we're seeing small. it, but we're also seeing your uh, slides on the side. So. Okay. Well. That's okay. I guess you we're can just, go ahead. Go ahead. This, this, this is this just this is just to this is just to. Uh, just to give an idea, I'm not, I'm not sure why it's not doing that. Um, the second track is business administration. So it's about actually running your business, um, your, how, to, how to hire and fire, how to do marketing, how to learn about business ethics, how to run your business instead of letting the, the business run you, right? How to actually run it. And, and, and this is the, the one part that will close the gap between clinical excellence and your business expertise, because you could be an excellent clinician, but if you don't know how to run the business, you're not going to be in business for very long, or you're going to be very frustrated. Uh, you're going to be um, having those, you know, difficult nights, sleeping, uh, trying to figure out how to deal with insurance and the complaints that the patients have, et cetera. And the third part of this program is about research, um, doing the research, learning how to approach a problem, how to solve a problem. And this will open door to uh, publications. It will open door to being consulting to, to, to big companies. Um, it would open doors to maybe teaching at different institution. If that's something that you desire um, down the line, and it certainly is one part of, of leveraging your time. Uh, example here on, on a finance track would be personal and business finance, management of debt, uh, setting up corporations, uh, on the business administration, the basic business system, um, how you're going to do marketing. We call that magnetic marketing, which is getting people who come in, who stay, pay, and then refer more uh, patients to you. We're offering scholarship opportunities. The program is being taught by a global um, faculty, and several of you, well, I mean, all of you are on here uh, as part of the HEX Commission. Uh, we've published a book. We've, you're all welcome to go and check out the book. Uh, it's called Doctor to Doctor, Success Strategies, Elevating Your Business and Personal Life. And I think writing a book is one way to position you as an authority. Uh, you can check out the website at drhb.org. And then uh, mark your calendar for December 8th to 10th in Vegas. We will be holding a Doctor to Doctor Work Gala. It's going to be uh, in conjunction with Action to Win, which is one of my events. And we are going to have doctors from different disciplines come and share with us their expertise, share with us their challenges. We're going to all help each other uh, get better with everything we do. So throughout the morning, I'm, I'm so glad that everything was pointing to this DHB program, which basically is how do you how do you solve all these problems, right? We were talking about uh, how do you talk to patients? How do you educate the patient about what you do? Well, one of the things that, that you can do is you learn how to position yourself. So if you, for example, we're talking about optometry. If, if you were writing, let's say a chapter, or maybe you're writing a whole book, and I know Dr. Susan Tron has a book um, that she wrote all to herself, right? But if, imagine if you write a handbook just for your patients. And you say, this is what optometry is all about. And this is what insurance means when you're in an optometry, optometrist chair, right? Yes, 
your insurance will cover a part of your screening, but no, it's not gonna cover the Prada uh, lens or, 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 or frames that you want. That's a different story. And you can actually communicate that already in your handbook, or maybe you write a blog on your website. And, and maybe you don't have to write the blog, you get somebody else to write the blog for you, but you position yourself when some, so when somebody call you, you refer them, go, go check out my website. They look at the blog, what does insurance mean when you come to my office? They come in, they already know, they already know they want that Prada uh, lens or frames, but they know that the insurance won't cover it. You're gonna eliminate some of those questions. Uh, if they see that Dr. Susan wrote a book, well, she's not the same as the, the doctor who's in Walmart, right? Because she wrote a book. So she, she must be smarter, she, um, she knows more, she's an expert, maybe she's speaking at different events. All of that is gonna position yourself so when they come in, they know that they're not dealing with the ordinary doctor. And that's what I, I love about the DHB program is it's teaching you, it's giving you the tools so you can be out there being different. You can market yourself different, even if you're in a group practice. Even if you're in a group practice and they come in and they say, oh yeah, this is a whole like holistic healthcare, whatever clinic, but I, I specifically want to see Dr. Susan because she's that different person and she could be in the a, in a insurance directory for all we care, right? But when they actually go and look you up, you're not just the optometrist. If they Google your name, I encourage all of our colleagues, go Google your name, right? And see what comes up. I know for me, about 10 pages come up and it's all about my speaking, my being on different uh, panels, on different podcasts, my writing for magazine. There's, there's very little about me being a dentist. And if somebody care and they go and they look me up like that, they're gonna say, this is not the ordinary dentist. And, and they may choose to stay with me. They may choose to spend money with me, but it's because I educated them. So um, that's, that's my part of sharing. And, and I hope that kind of tie things together. I, I don't wanna say DHP is the answer to your to all your problems, but DHB is the answer to all your problems. You know, I'm going to jump in um, with uh, just for, for you, Emily, because I mean, everything that we've discussed today, I know I'm the last one to go, Pavel. I'm going to jump in. You guys are all right ahead, brother. So I, I, I'm not even going to rehash a bunch of the topics because you already know just the uh, communication, Dr. Trong, excellent. That's exactly what we need to do for our patients, but also with our team as well. I mean, if you look into, into the well-oiled machine practices out there, everyone who works in that organization knows what their role is. And it's something that you don't say once, but you say over and over again, because roles change. So you may have an older employee who's been with your company for five, six, seven, 10 years, but they're not giving you their best now because we've kind of lost track of what was your role again? Or oh, 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 they have lost track of what am I doing here again? Yes, they may be doing the day-to-day -day, nine to five type deal, clocking in, clocking out and good employees, but giving them that fire, giving them that ability to overperform and outperform because they feel the need to, 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 to keep their, their, their skills sharp is important. And as, and as leaders of the team, let's face it, we are, we have to constantly be giving that to our team. And like you said, when the patient comes in, we have to remember to refocus. Okay, okay, okay. What's our role here? We're here for the patient. Okay, let's not get bogged down by you know the attitude that they may have on the phone or whatever. Reframe your mindset and say, okay, good. This has nothing to do with me. This is because of something that I don't understand that they may be going through. So just keeping that composure, it does help. It does help. So communication to your team as well as the patient is important. Um, to Dr. Latran's point, the DHB will help with. Uh, the brunt of what we will discuss today. I work in the insurance world for now. And what we have is basically doctors like myself in the beginning, don't take the time to understand what the contracts say when they get tied in or, or when they go to bed with some of these companies. So having that, taking that time to understand your payer, understand what is what they, they're gonna reimburse is key. And not only understanding, but tracking keeping an eye on that bottom line. You know, a lot of people who are in the physician space, all they want to do is take care of patients. And that's great. But we do need to have our eye on the bottom line. We do need to understand the basics of, okay, why is this up? Why is this down? And why is this stagnant? 
and be able to ask those questions because the people who we have working for us, whether it's in the billing space or the back office space who are doing that stuff for us, as once they know that Dr. Latran or Dr. Trong or Dr. Or Dr. Chong or, you know, any of us is asking, hey, you know, I noticed last quarter we were down by 3.5%. What, what happened there? People's ears perk up. Oh, you check that? Yeah, I do. Why is that down? And it forces people to stay on their toes. You know, I'm not saying that we have bad employees that are malicious and going to take from us, which can happen, but employees work better when they, when, when they know that, okay, the boss has an understanding of what I do. You don't have to know everything, but knowing what kinds of questions to ask. And that's where the DHB comes in. And I love that. Um, benchmark performance is key. What that means is understanding what your key performance indicators are in your practice. And we all have them. We all know them. You know, and related and keeping track of that as time progresses, you know, you know, the insurance payments, you know, you know, uh, salaries of the people who work for us, um, the performance budget, you know, being able to kind of make those those um, those those graphs and, and, and track those over time will help those of us who are in the beginning of practice in the middle of practice, be able to take our practices to the next level, because like Dr. Truong said, we know it's a business, we got to keep the lights on. You know, and, and, and what we've seen with the pandemic and everything going on, a lot of smaller practices had to shut down, you know, and by and large, it probably was because of the fact that they weren't prepared to pivot in a time of strife and stress. I mean, we know that the whole um, global pandemic is, yeah, it's, it's maybe winding down, but we all, now we have to think what's on the horizon to come up next? How, how is my practice going to survive the next whatever it is? You know, let, let's not give it a name yet, but... How, how am I going to take myself to the next level and not hurt the bottom line? You know, where can I pivot? You know, whether it's into the online space, you know, or whether it's bringing in additional revenue streams, which fit my business model, you know, like along the healthcare line, you know, and, 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 and that comes with educating our patients on other interests we have and other things we do, you know, in terms of whether it's supplements, whether it's other treatments that we offer that they can benefit from. Because let's face it, if they trust you enough to take care of them, you know, why not? Why not offer them something that you know could help them based on what they have, you know? So th I just wanted to make sure like we, we touch on that. I, I don't want to rehash a lot of other stuff, you know? And, 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 and of course, the big thing I, 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 my wife and I pride ourselves on is kind of keeping a positive culture in the actual practice, you know, making sure everyone enjoys coming to work, you know? Because let's face it, you spend more time at work than you do at home, most of us. The people in your, in, your, in your office are the ones that become, quote unquote, family, because guess what? From eight to five, that's all you see. You know, when you get home at seven o'clock or six o'clock or whatever, two hours with the kids uh, or the spouse and then off to bed, wake up at 6 a.m. to do it again. So, you know, creating that positive culture in your practice is key, whether it's, you know, doing staff functions, you know, kind of re-engaging with staff on a regular basis. How are you doing? You know, and, 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 and what we do in our practice is, I tell all my staff, you know what, we want to see you grow. We want to see you take yourself from here to there. And mind you, if it, if it happens and you have to move on to a new business or a new practice because you've outgrown us, that's a positive thing. That's great. You know, I mean, we want to be part of your story, you know, and I think all business owners have a fear of losing good employees. No, 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 Let, let's not do too much because she may want to go somewhere else or he may want to go somewhere else. I mean, we have to face it. It's a good thing to grow employees because an employee will stay with you if you are invested in who they are and as they grow. And they will find ways to stick around because if, you know what, I was with Dr. Latran for 10 years and I went from being front office, now I'm a dental hygienist in the back, I'm not leaving. I mean, she has always been there. She helped, she coached me. She helped me get to this point. Why would I go anywhere else? I want to grow within the company. You know, and people, people like that. People like knowing that they're, they're feeling that they're invested in a company that has their best interest at heart, you know? So that's, that's how I want to tie it together, Pavel. I don't want to, I, I don't want to go through and spend a whole long time. Kind of Dr. Like, Morris, it's always a pleasure thing. to, it's always a pleasure to listen to your wisdom. Listen, you know, two hours uh, went by very quick when you're having fun. So before I uh, turn the, uh, uh, to uh, all of you and ask you for a closing comment uh, uh, for our wonderful presentation and show today, I just want to announce that we'll be holding our uh, fourth HEX Commission meeting on um, uh, December 12th. So that's going to be the final one. And uh, most likely, 
because of our policies. Um, uh, I was the moderator this year, and uh, uh, unfortunately, you'll have to say goodbye to me as a moderator, and I, I will be replaced, I'm sure, by someone much better with much more talent, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. And of course, perhaps I may pop up and be one of the commissioners. Uh, we'll see. But I invite you all to join us and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and be part of the uh, fun. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, basically start with Dr. Uh, uh, Alan Chong and uh, uh, just go around the, uh, the, the room and uh, just... What, what, what I love post. about uh, t today's... Um you know, meeting of minds and, and docs is, is to be able to share with you, the audience, that uh, there are a lot of commonality. Uh, there is a lot of commonality with issues worldwide for doctors. Uh, one being insurance for sure, a frustrating one. Uh, is that gonna change instantly? No, but, but um, the, the communication issue is for sure staffing. And then uh, learning more as a practitioner yourself so that you can be a better practitioner. And, and certainly my message was be a, be a good practitioner for the right reasons. And regardless of who is paying the bill is uh, to, to do practice for the right reasons. And that is to get the patients better and have them be healthier uh, people. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chong, for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Okay. Chong, uh, would you like to say anything in closing? Yes, thank you. Again, I, I appreciate all of our time here and all of you in the audience spending time with us. And hopefully you've, uh, if you didn't find a little bit of some tools, hopefully, you know, uh, a lot, many, many different pearls to help you grow as a practitioner, but not only you, but your, your team, your staff, and which in turn, in effect, it affects and impact uh, your patients. And um, you know, just do, here's what I always say, it, it, it doesn't matter, look, look at all of us from different disciplines. Again, more similars, right? More similarities than differences is yes, go through life, do, do what's good, but more so do what's right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Dr. Kriak. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Um, you know, um, I kind of like to echo uh, Dr. Chong and Dr. Throng's um, uh, comments, but also just wanted to say one thing to remember is uh, why it is that we're here. Um, and that is to, um, uh, we serve. We are serving um, our patients and um, then uh, we need to do what we can for them. Um, but, you know, going back to an old reference, you know, and kind of echoing a little bit what uh, Dr. Latran said, and that was, you know, um, if you give a man a fish, uh, you'll feed him for a day. You teach him to fish, you'll feed him for life. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a matter of us all working together, um, uh, remembering why we are here, but we have to help our patients, but we can also help our patients help themselves. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kriak. Uh, Dr. Pretender. Yes. Uh, well, a great show, uh, my colleagues, and I hope the audience is also uh, enjoying the show. Uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, I would like to say that COVID-19 has really increased some pressure on our highly complex medical system and expensive healthcare, and uh, it's making it more urgent uh, uh, to lower some costs. And insurance companies, uh, <laughs> uh, I will again like to say that please uh, either either be uh, uh, you know uh, in a synergistic effect on us. Uh, not a parasitic effect on doctors and the patients. Uh, the, my stress is, uh, if, if it is synergism, we can, we can uh, do a very effective treatment planning. And uh, if, you, if you keep on uh, hampering us with your plans, we need to have a lot of administrative stuff, which is going to increase our costing, and we have to charge more, leading to some more costings and uh, equipment as well. So I would like to say, let's let's be in harmony. And any doctor who is uh, uh, suffering from any sort of this, uh, we are we as X Commission uh, are the first authority. Please reach to us, uh, Dr. Pavel. Uh, you can tell them uh, where they can reach us, and uh, we are there to help. And, uh, I'll give them your uh, cell phone. 
<laughs> yes, so we are there to help uh, any doctors who is in problem, and uh, uh, hopefully we have some uh, nice time uh, uh, with the companies, insurance companies to choose to plan, or maybe uh, no companies. Let's 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 do it on our own. Let's see how the system goes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Pleasure having you, and Dr. Letran. Well, thank you everyone for for coming on this morning. I know everybody have. A family and you want to spend time with your family and you and you um, decide to spend two hours here sharing your insights with colleagues um, I think that's really really great I just want to say uh, I just learned that the our talk today was shared in 1,000 groups uh, it doesn't mean uh, you know it doesn't mean a thousand people are watching but they're in the group already and they will be watching uh, my invitation is for all of our colleagues from different disciplines, uh, just go on to the thread, ask questions, share something. We would love to be uh, your resource. If we don't know the answer, we will find somebody who, who can give us the answers. Uh, join us in our podinars because that's how we regularly communicate with you. Uh, mark your calendar for December 8th to 10th of next year to join us in our gala. And um, join us, take a look at our uh, doctorate of healthcare's business program. If it's not for you, maybe you know somebody that is right for them. We we didn't, I don't think we need one more thing to do. <laughs> All of us here, we decided to do that because we care. Because at some point in our lives, we had the mentor, the coaching, the consultant who helped us learn. We already invested a lot of money and time in that. And we just, we wanna help accelerate um, your progress and for all of us to be successful. And thank you, Pavel, for, for hosting. I, I, it's going to be hard to find somebody who, who look more handsome than you, you know, oh, as, as, you a, so much, as a commissioner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I will put the blame on Keanu Shah and whoever the next person <laughs> he, thank you so much. He, he, he picks. But thank you so much for being such a gracious host. And we'll see well, you again in it, December. It's been a pleasure, everyone. Uh, Dr. Morris, you went less, so I don't know if you want to uh, put an additional closing comment, but uh, uh, without further ado, I just want to thank everyone. Thank our audience. Uh, and, and I mean, you guys are awesome people out there. Our colleagues, we all love you. We're here for you. We encourage you to grow. Uh, grow early on in your careers. Uh, join the Global Summit organization uh, because the future is coming even uh, at a pace that, uh, that will be faster than uh, expected. And don't forget one thing from the VGO man, your work is your signature. So I love you all on behalf of uh, Global Summits, Dr. Keanu Shah and the uh, HEX commissioners. Uh, I thank you all for your time and for joining us today. Stay well and stay healthy. Before we leave, just drhb.com. Like Emily said, I, I believe everyone who is in clinical practice needs this education because you don't get it from anywhere else. And to have it consolidated into one specific program, that is powerful. So you, you may think you're not, you don't need it. We all do. So drhb.com. Go check it out, guys. It's something that I think is going to revolutionize the practice of medicine for all of us. Yeah, Thank you guys. Uh, uh, Thank you. like to add on uh, to Dr. Morris. Yes. And if you can log into a global summits page, you're going to find a bunch of more websites, top 100, Hex Commission, Hippocratic Oath, and uh, Gala. You don't know what we are talking about. Please log into our page and see what, what, what's going on with, uh, with, with different specialities. I, I, I'm, I loved it with the optometrics, the chiropractors, the medicine, dentistry, philosophy. I'm loving it. We are a family. Thank you very much. That's right. And the family is growing. Love you guys all. Kisses. Mwah. Thanks, Phil. Take Thanks care. Thanks all. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.